Um, there's been a lot of work on trying to improve this um, random access channel procedure to tailor it to IoT, um, but I think the the general consensus is they need they need a very revolutionary kind of agnostic approach. Um, so what has been done in 5B to address this? Um, to address obviously the, the spectrum flexibility. We have um, more granular uh, subcarrier spacings, uh, 15, 30, 60, and 120. Um, the transmission time interval has been divided down from uh, one millisecond to a quarter, called mini, mini slots, and it's um, 0.125, so we can have faster. Um, faster communication, particularly for packets that are small and don't need a TTI that long. Um, there also have been some um, efforts in terms of um, establishing pre-configured or semi-persistent scheduling to completely eliminate or eliminate most of the signaling overhead. Um, uh, but this also only works when uh, the traffic is quite predictable. Uh, it doesn't really work for bursty, unknown traffic, um, it, especially event triggered ones, because then um, we either kind of pre-allocate resources that are um, most most of the time wasted, or um, we don't have enough. Basically, when uh, we have a, 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 a spur of um, of devices wanting to access, um, there has been some efforts as well to reduce the four-way handshake from four to two um, by combining each couple of messages, and then we have a single round trip, and that. Um, reduces the latency significantly, um, but again, uh, for certain um, machine type communications, uh, this is still heavy, heavily based on grant, on grant, access, uh, grant requests and still not suitable. Um, one, one use case I'm basically particularly interested in is um, working to beyond 5G, um, you know, 5G is mostly about terrestrial communication networks, and then uh, going beyond 5G and towards 6G, there has been some talk about some joint design between satellite and terrestrial, talk about dense satellite systems, especially with um, kind of SpaceX's um, recent activity on launching about tens of thousands of satellite um, to try to do some global network. This is like a general visualization of what would it, it would look like in the future. Uh, so working towards reducing latency, um, increasing reliability, obviously increasing coverage. And satellite is well known um, to have adopted our random access protocols from a long time ago. And the reason is that there is um, the long the long range. It allows, um, well, it, it not doesn't allow um, heavy signaling because it just incurs un unacceptable latencies. So um, yeah, that's a bit of a background. Um, and so our motivation comes in two parts, grant free NOMA, um, and that both of them kind of contradict what 4G and 5G are mostly about. 5G does support some grant free NOMA, but I think the details of those um, in the studies are still not been finalized and are quite a bit vague. Um, so the grant free part mean, it means that we eliminate the um, scheduling, uh, we eliminate the overhead that um, they don't need to act request the grant uh, to, to be able to transmit. And the NOMA part is basically addressing the orthogonal structure of 4G and 5G, which is basically OFDM, where um, the idea is that in a certain time frequency resource, only one user gets to transmit or only one user gets to be recovered. Um, and, and that idea will, I will show for the particular case of the finite block length is strictly suboptimal. So uh, classically, we know that um, this is the roughly what the channel uh, capacity looks like for multiple access for the case, special case of two users. Um, and the idea that has been that has supported us using orthogonal access for so long is that with orthogonal access, we can simplify the detection and encoding because we only focus on one signal at, at, the, at, a, at a single time, but, and we can also achieve the capacity. Whereas NOMA or the, Sometimes they call it position coding, um, you know, incurs a lot of complexity because you might need to do them jointly and you have to deal with more than one signal at some time. So um, recent advances in information theory, um, this is a particular paper that I like um, by Malevi and Jazzy and Lehman back in 2015, and I have a series following onward, is they show that this is the classical kind of multiple access channel capacity for um, infinite block length, asymptotic. Um, and this is what they've come up with, a few approximations for the finite block length. And this is where they found TDMA to kind of reach. So there is a gap between, it is, it is not capacity optimal. Um, and they, sh they actually show in their proofs that these capacity regions or um, basically curves are only achievable if you do NOMA. Um, so if multiple users share the same time frequency resources and there's joint decoding at the, user, at the decoder side. Um, so NOMA is a very, very vast um, 
topic, heaps of um, surveys in the literature explaining, um, listing these different scenarios, listing these different, um, the different schemes are, I won't go through that. I'll just explain the main kind of niche for all of them, which is um, if we have multiple users transmitting over the same resources and we know very little about their number, their identity, um, there's possibly their, their code, their code, um, code structure, um, then what we do is we design some distinguishers um, and they can be of, of multiple um, forms. They can be of the form of power, Levels. They can be of code books. They can be of the form of scramblers, interleavers, um, some pilot, some uh, signature sequences. Um, but basically, they allow us to distinguish the users from one another. And provided that no two users use the same distinguisher, whatever it is it, it may be, um, we can recover the users um, accurately at the expense of some complexity. So yeah, so these are the main structures uh, for grant free Noma. Um, and this is a very generic kind of uh, fr framework where you can see from one time slot to the other, um, the number of users that are active, which are colored here, uh, change and the identity changes. Um, and what happens is um, if, they are, if they are attached to a certain signature sequence, um, then we can do some autocorrelations and cross-correlations similar to the ones that we do in 4G um, in the random access channel, um, but in this case, um, the, the data and the pilots are combined together and transmitted in one shot. Um, and so we can do decoding straight away and we kind of avoid this whole core way handshake. This is the general setup. Um, so inspired by some work in information theory on the bounds and the, and the, the assumptions they take on the bounds, we, um, I'll, I'll explain those and then I'll go through the system model that we, we, we take. Um, so there's, a, there's one called Go, Go, Gaussian many access and the, the distinguishing part about how they define their bound based on the, in different and differentiating that from the previous band that I showed you the more classical assumption is that the number of users they take and the block length both go to infinity whereas in the previous case for example we only had two users so it's quite finite. Um, and not only that, they consider that the number of users can scale linearly with the block length. So you can see that kind of um, goes in hand in hand with the massive machine type communication scenarios that we have, the massive access. And so in this case, we can have more users than the actual block length. And they assume that the user activity is random. Um, and then they derive the capacity and it has a, a, an interesting form where it is exactly like the one with the known access minus some penalty factor. For, um, and this penalty is because of the, the signature sequences we have to add to be able to distinguish the users from one another and to kind of decode that randomness. Um, and it's and for those of you familiar with the core of uh, Polanski core Verdue bound, it's kind of similar. So you have the Shannon bound minus some penalty factor because of the finite length. Um, the other one, which is the one we kind of, I think both of these were released in uh, 2017, is called a random coding bound where um, as opposed to assigning different users with unique sequences or signature sequences, they assume that the users all use the same code books and that through coding, we can have a mapping, a unique mapping uh, from one to many. So based on the sum, if I can decode the sum of um, messages that I've received correctly, then I can accurately map this to the list of messages that were sent. Um, in this case, the receiver is not concerned with identifying the users or deciding which message was sent by which user. It's only um, interested in recovering the list of messages or as many messages as possible. And so the error is basically the number of messages that did not appear in the list, but were in fact transmitted. So um, this random coding bound kind of its main advantage is seen in terms of the power, power efficiency. So if you can see in comparison, this is the number of active users. So as the number of active users increases, the required EV over and not kind of is steady as opposed to more popular schemes in random access, such as um, the Aloha scheme. So this brings me, um, not to take over Cal's time, just roughly to the system model, I'll introduce that and then hand over to him. Um, so we first introduced a multi-layer design, so a combined design between power and code. So based on the random coding bounds, we have a layer, we call it a layer, where all the users have the same power and all the users use the same code. And if the code is made up of two um, concatenated, concatenated codes, one is for just power, power uh, sorry, error correction, 
as traditional. And one is to ensure that many to one mapping, that unique mapping, that if we have uh, the superposition of a certain number of code words that are unique, we can actually recover everything just from the sum. Um, and we repeat that over multiple layers. Um, and each layer has its own power. So, um, you know, we can detect the power and then we can know the layer and then we go forward um, with the with the with the decoding so we have combination of detection and decoding and the they can happen in parallel for each layer um, and our initial work this is an example of what they would um what would what would be received at the receiver for for example a case of um two layers uh, bpsk signal and maybe a single user in each layer um, but I'll, I'll skip that for time's sake um, and in our initial work the first time we introduced this multi-layer design we focused on just optimizing the powers and in the um, and we found that to be quite um, simple through a nice mixed integer linear programming. Again, I won't go through the details of that because it's not the main objective. But that's when we first introduced the system. Um, it was in I think I have the reference here in the slides. Um, and then in the second part, what we try to do through deep learning is do the coding part of things, um, the encoding and the decoding. So I'll, I'll hand over to you, Cal. Stop my share. So is Tao already here? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Here. Okay, so um, I will continue with the deep learning approach for the uh, ground free normal. Yes. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, basically the uh, artificial intelligence is the uh, key in the main, uh, technology for the 60 of uh, the um, optimization. So um, as well as that the uh, upcoming 5G will be supported partially over by the AI and the 60 will be uh, fully drafted support by AI for automation. So the advancements in the machine learning will be able to create more intelligent networks for the real-time communications in 60. And the AI will be able to increase the efficiency and also reduce the processing delay of the communication steps. Uh, for example, like those uh, time consuming tasks. And um, for the existing uh, communication system design, it is uh, divided by the, uh, the system will be divided by a chain of multiple uh, processing blocks. And each of the uh, blocks will be responsible for a specific subtask, such as like source coding, uh, channel coding, moderation, uh, channel estimation, and utilization. Uh, but this approach, it is efficient, but not but suboptimal because it cannot achieve the uh, what we call uh, optimum end-to-end -end performance. And uh, for deep learning, on the other hand, actually is an end-to-end -end learning of communication systems that can, you know, uh, jointly optimize the transmit and receiver in a single process and does not have a rigorous uh, modular uh, structure. And in terms of the uh, hardware, um, the deep learning can be executed in parallel uh, processing architectures such as, such as GPU and also or like some other specialized machine learning chips. So this means that so we can um, have higher processing speed and with lower processing uh, latency and uh, lower energy cost. 
And another uh, advantage of the deep learning is that um, the existing design uh, most of the time are relied on the uh, mathematical modeling and analysis. So um, in order to first um, use the, uh, our analysis, now we will have uh, simplified assumptions, for example, like uh, linear system, uh, stationary uh, channel modeling, uh, Gaussian distribution of the noise. Um, so, but this is not necessarily um, happening in the real system. Um, so uh, the deep learning based communication system, uh, it does not really require such a mathematic uh, a model. So it's really, it's actually traced the system as a black box. Um, this is the um, system model that we have used um, for our preliminary uh, study of the uh, deep learning approach for the uh, uh, ground uh, free uh, NOMA. So basically we can see here that we have a uh, list of users and for each user that we are using a compacted code. Um, so for each of the users we will transmit their signal into the channel simultaneously. And then in this particular, uh, in this preliminary, uh, preliminary study that we assume the uh, channel is a division channel. And after the uh, uh, receiver, the base station, what we want to do is that we want to decode the list of the code words that have been transmitted by uh, all the users. Okay, and uh, here that for this concatenated codes that we have a BAC code, which is a uh, BAC code is stand for uh, binary uh, add codes and the FEC will be, FEC code will be just um, the uh, normal forward error correction codes. So for this part, the FEC code can be just like uh, uh, normal uh, convolutional codes or turbo codes or LDBC codes. And uh, we have actually chosen a specific code for the BAC code. So um, this is an um, example of the BSA code will be uh, BCH code. Um, the, uh, actually the uh, parity check metrics of the, the BCH codes um, can be chosen. Uh, this is because that if a user chose their sequence actually from the columns of the uh, binary BCH codes, uh, binary, binary BCH parity check metrics with the error correction capability uh, T, so this actually means the uh, their distance. Um, so the individual transmitted the sequence can, can actually be decoded from their sequence summation with a small error probability. Um, error probability provides the following conditions being met. So the first condition is that the sum of their sequences can be correctly decoded by the receiver side. Um, and the second one is there are no more than T users have transmitted simultaneously. And the third condition is that all the users will choose distinct uh, sequences. And um, this is the uh, deep learning structure that we have used for this uh, study. So basically we uh, plugged in the uh, selected BAC code into uh, each user here. And also for the FEC uh, encoder, the Ford error correction code, we're actually using a fully collected neural network. Um, just uh, if you are not familiar with the uh, fully collected neural network, it is actually uh, has a structure like this. So basically it has, uh, it has uh, inputs, what we call input layer, and also it has uh, what we call uh, output layer. And uh, in the middle, we have uh, many uh, layers of neurons and all the neurons, they are actually fully collected uh, with the uh, layers uh, in front and also with the layers uh, after it. So uh, in this whole system is um, called a fully collected neural network. So basically we plug in this structure into the uh, structure here for each user. And each user will use, actually use the same uh, encoder structure. And also for the uh, receiver side, it will use um, a lot of uh, fully collected neural network. So um, in our study that we have using uh, what we call a training data set um, is two times 10 to the power of five. And the, this is the uh, validation data set we're using and the, the testing data sets. 
And the training that we have done for this uh, study is at EV handle is 8 dB. And we are using an item optimizer and we are using a minimized uh, training process. And because here that we are having the cases that we have multiple uh, users actually transmitting uh, a different time. So actually the training is mixed with the cases with different number of active users. Okay. So um, this will be the um, simulation results. So um, for this simulation results that we're actually using the uh, BCH code where it's um, the T is equal to four. And in this first uh, result here that we have a forward error correction, which is rate is one over two. And um, here that's uh, for this simulation result that uh, um, the x axis is the uh, EB over N0, which is the uh, single quality. And for the uh, y axis, it is the error performance. And uh, so we can see that um, when we read this uh, diagram, it is that so with the increased uh, single quality, the error performance will actually decrease. And um, here we're comparing uh, our simulation result, which is this one here. So that's the machine learning decoding. Uh, results here and also compare this against the uh, maximum likelihood of decoding which is the uh, performance result here. So as we can see that uh, the uh, machine learning uh, result actually is very close to the uh, optimum uh, maximum likelihood decoding and actually it has a huge improvement comparing to a uh, low complexity and low performance uh, BMD decoding algorithms here. And this simulation result actually shows the uh, code rate is equal to one. So here, what we mean by the code rate is equal to one is means it means that the uh, encoding and uh, uh, the uh, before the encoding and after the encoding here in this um, uh, neural network structure, um, the uh, number of input and number of output is the same. So this means that the code rate is equal to one. And here, it is interesting to say that. Um, we are actually having this uh, machine learning output is actually performs better than the uh, maximum likelihood decoding. So this is because of that here we treat the uh, maximum likelihood decoding that so we don't have um, an extra encoding here, but for the machine learning we still kept the uh, neural network structure, but it, it still did some kind of encoding, but it just the uh, code rate is equal to one. Um, and this is the uh, third um, simulation result. And because of the, uh, we're using the machine learning, so that means that the uh, training actually is performed based on a certain uh, loss function. And then this actually gives us the fle uh, flexibility to uh, play around with a different loss function. So uh, for this particular, for this um, simulation result here, we actually, we have the same system set up as the code rate is equal to half. And uh, actually we then uh, we have uh, cases where we have one users, two users, three users, and four users. And in this case, we actually gave more weights on the three user case and four user cases. And also we combined training a two uh, single to loss ratio. So one is eight dB and one is 12 dB. And we also gave more weights on the 12 dB here. So basically we can say that in this case, we can say uh, the solid curve here is the result with the uh, weighted loss training and the Dyson line here is the uh, without uh, uh, weighted loss training. So we can say there's a performance improvements uh, that if we have the uh, uh, training that's giving uh, more weight. And also oh, it's interesting to say that uh, for example here, this blue curve here, um, And we can actually say that um, the we can say the uh, green. I think that's 
Okay, we can see that the green code here, which is three user case, actually performs better than the uh, two user cases because we are simply giving uh, more ways in, this, uh, in the training process. So this means that uh, if we play around the, uh, the training, uh, the uh, loss function, then we are actually have uh, a different uh, simulation results. Um, okay, so there are some open challenges for the uh, machine learning based um, now a circular multiple access. So um, the first one is that we um, currently we are only limited to um, the uh, message size is uh, quite limited and we are only allowed like uh, four users to transmit uh, at the maximum. So this means that if we actually um, extend the uh, uh, a large message size also and also more users, this means that we uh, when we go through, go through the training, we need to actually let the uh, system to say uh, more uh, different cases. So this means that we need to have more uh, training uh, sizes. And also uh, in terms of the uh, training singular to loss ratio. So and this is actually also very tricky because currently we are uh, picked the, uh, um, the training uh, singular to loss ratio at 8 dB for our particular uh, example. Um, but uh, in general, that it is a bit uh, difficult to guess that so which is similar to not ratio that we need to pick and to train. And I guess that so we can we can get some idea from the uh, optimum uh, decoding performance and choosing a single to not ratio that uh, that might work. And another uh, challenge is that how to balance the uh, performance and the complexity uh, when we chose the uh, neural network structure here. So. If the neural network structure, that's uh, it is uh, more complex, so meaning that it's, it will be have more capability of doing the uh, uh, encoding and also decoding is similar to what we uh, normally know on the, for example, like the convolution code that we can choose a simple convolution code or choosing one that has a more constrained size and memory block, so it can perform better. And, um, Another uh, challenge is that the optimum choice of loss function. Um, so um, as we have seen that uh, uh, because we're using the machine learning uh, algorithm that it will give us the uh, flexibility to choose different uh, loss functions, but so which one actually gives us the uh, optimum uh, performance it is uh, unknown. And um, in our preliminary study that we have limited our uh, system in uh, AWG channel and uh, uh, how we actually uh, incorporate the uh, channel state information for fading channel is also an uh, 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 open uh, question. And also how to learn that uh, um, if you have more uh, users that's uh, in the system, how, uh, how to uh, enable the system to be able to know that which user actually transmit uh, uh, which information is also a challenging problem. Um, okay, so I gave this uh, back to Rana for the uh, conclusion. I think, I think you've summarized well. I think there's, uh, with regards to time, um, I think this is a, a uh, this work is like a, a stepping stone. There's not, we haven't seen any other work on deep learning for uh, for grant free from grant free access. There's probably like one or two for NOMA in general. Um, we submitted this as a magazine article um, just to show some initial results and possibly to set some sort of benchmark um, for people to compare against as as this uh, area moves forward. Yeah, that's, I think that's it for me. Thank you. <laughs>